Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Hope everybody's doing well. Again, this as usual, we're going to have quite a program today. Uh, uh, you know, we've been hearing it from a from not necessarily a political aspect of it, but a concern is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, you know, from from uh, from as far as Congress is concerned, as far as the president is concerned, everybody's trying to figure out how do we get our get our labor force back in place, if you will, with the whole issue of uh, of work being basically outside of these United States and other areas. I mean, middle class are really having a tough time. I mean, you, you've also seen the, the whole issue of people demonstrating all the Wall Street and the whole like and with this, that, and the other. We've got a real problem this very good. But anyway, what I thought we'd do the, this today is that I thought I'd bring someone on that has a, a direct line, if you will, to maybe defining the whole issue of, of labor. And, and I think that's a very important one. And I'm talking about Sam Gillespie. Uh, he's now associated with the UFCW. Uh, and, and he's a grievous director there. But anyway, Sam's been on the show on a number of occasions, and I thought it would be a, a unique opportunity to, to discuss with Sam about various aspects of it from, the, from a labor standpoint, and I think that's a very important piece. So with that, I'm just going to go bring Sam right on in. Sam, how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Good, good, good. First off, how's, how's Nancy doing? Nancy's doing well. I got to make sure good. she's doing. That's she's right. doing well. Okay, without Nancy, it's okay. I mean, nothing goes, right? That's right. That's okay, why I'm fine. here today. She said, okay. That's fine. I say uh, hi, Nancy. I'm going to make hi, sure Nancy. I say hi, Nancy. How you doing, dear? Hi, Sean. Good, okay. good. Hey, by the way, let, let's let's do this to, for the benefit of those who've not seen you before, because you know we've been we've known them for a number of years. But let's talk a little bit about Sam Gillespie and how did you get in this particular business, okay? Okay. Talk about it. I'll try and give you the Reader's Digest right. version. But okay. I, at 19 years old, went to work for Standard Oil of California, and uh, it was a union shop. And I was over in, uh, later in Central Washington State University in Ellensburg, and I became the shop steward. Well, <clears throat> long story short, I got fired for union activities, and I filed a grievance with my union. It was the Standard Station Employees Union out of uh, located headquartered out of uh, San Francisco and Seattle, and uh, took a long time, two and a half years, but I won my job back. Had I known that I was going to win that uh, for sure, then I probably would have went to law school. But things work out for a reason. I wanted to teach school and uh, levy and bond failures in Washington State in the early seventies. Mm. I wasn't able to get that, but I had taken an an exam, civil service exam in Portland. Uh, Oregon to become a labor and it was my third shot so I lost a job early on in my uh, working life because I didn't take it so I came down on a Tuesday and I said okay and uh, Thursday I was to start I went home and uh, I worked myself into a union position three months later. What with, department was that you were working? I was working for the uh, Public Works Department, Public Department and then right. they put me over at water, the Water Bureau. Okay. Okay. And then February 1st, 1975, I went to work for the union. Half time in September 1st of that year, I, uh, I was working for Oregon Asked Me Council 75 and uh, went to work full time on September 1. And I met uh, my adopted father, Lloyd Knudsen, at the... Uh, Who's been on the show, by the right, way. Right, in 1975 at the FLCL convention. And he kind of carried me. Uh, the uh, I had the... I got elected in uh, 1977 as the rep, as second the rep. Uh, second vice president of then the Multnomah County Labor Council. Right. Okay. And in 1980, I got elected as president, and then we changed the name in '81 or '82 to the Northwest Oregon Labor Council, which it is today. And uh, it was sort of a very colorful career during that so time. Who, I, who was mayor during that time? I, well, the first mayor when I came when you were there was Goldschmidt. President. Was Goldsmith, Goldsmith and then uh, they uh, was actually Goldschmidt. Yeah, he was just becoming mayor. We supported him for mayor. And uh, he beat Frank Ivancy. And then when Neil Goldschmidt went back to Washington, D.C. to serve as the transportation, uh, transportation secretary yeah. under the Carter administration, mm -hmm. Frank Ivancy became mayor. And then we had, um, I think it was... Uh, Vera? No, no. Yeah, we, we had uh, Bud Clark. Bud Clark, yeah, we had Bud Clark. Bud That's Clark right. beat Bud Frank Ivancy. That's right, I remember that. And then Ivancy went back to D.C. Right. And then we had... Um, 
uh, Vera Katz, Vera Katz right. and then we had, uh, of course, we we had Mayor Potter and right. Sam Adams. Right, right, right. He's very, he's so very. I spent three years of that time in Wisconsin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and from uh, 1988 to 91. Then you came back here, and right? You, you were working <clears throat> for. Went back to work for the city for a little bit, okay. And then I went back to work for AFSCME, and then I, in the year 2000, I went to work for UFCW mm -hmm. as a union rep, and then uh, about a year and a half ago. President Dan Clay and Secretary uh, Treasurer Jeff Anderson hired me as the grievance director okay, for the union. Okay. And what's the nature of that particular job? What, what do you normally well, do? Well, we that? have just what under 20,000 members in the entire state of Oregon and Southwest Washington mm -hmm. is our jurisdiction. And uh, we have union representatives file grievances, and then we work in a collaborative effort together as a team, and uh, we decide which cases we take to arbitration and which ones we don't. And I'm pleased to say that our uh, present administration taking a much more aggressive stance, something that we staff people have wanted for a long time. And if we have a 25 or 30 year employee who may have done something wrong, but probably not a dischargeable offense, mm -hmm. we're going to take it to arbitration. Mm -hmm. We're going to go down swinging, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy about the aggressive uh, nature that our union. And that's getting together with workers. the employer, right? You basically right. sitting down with him, and then I hit both sides negotiating that piece. The arbitrator is a neutral third person. He's okay. selected mutually by the parties, okay. and you go to a hearing. Mm -hmm. Usually takes at least a day. Sometimes they're two or three days, but most of the time we try to get them done in a day. An arbitrator is hired. They hear the evidence. If it's a discharge case, the burden of proof is on the employer. If it's a language case, it's usually the union. The, the arbitrator hears both sides. We do a post. We do an opening statement. We present our evidence. Then we write. Uh, we close the hearing. We do a post-hearing brief. Usually 30 days later, and then 30 days from that, the arbitrator renders a decision. And that's that's what organized labor does. Good, good. And I know the other thing too is I think when we met, we were sort of met in Salem. I think you and I. Mm -hmm. uh, you were lobbying at that point in time. And Perhaps. I think uh -huh. I was doing something similar right. or whatever. We just sort of met along the line. There you go. I, I wanted to share that with uh, with my viewing audience because um, we want to make sure that sometimes from a career standpoint, we got uh, the young folks out there trying to figure out well, what am I going to do, especially nowadays, you know, people graduating from college, nothing to do. Well, there's yeah. that, you know, there's a, a lot of people where college is not uh, there. Right. I, I tell you, you know, you, there's the building trades that there's, uh, you can get an apprenticeship program, and there's a lot of worthwhile jobs that need to be done and performed, and you don't need a college degree. Mm -hmm. Are there opportunities in the trades now? Well, it's kind of down because uh, of the economy. Mm -hmm. The building trades are reported as high as 35% unemployment uh, at one point in time when the state's been averaging right around uh, 10, and the national average still hovering at 9.2 percent mm -hmm. unemployed mm -hmm. to way too many people mm -hmm. unemployed mm -hmm. well now now that you've given us sort of your background on it, let's talk to something more specific in regards to what's on the table now in, in terms of work and then talk about uh, your involvement uh, uh, quote uh, some of the some of the areas that you are are, are focusing on to uh, to, to to specifically on that on a particular project you know what I'm saying? okay like, well, like the first project of all, labor agreement things of that nature okay Project Labor Agreement uh, is something as I'm on the executive board of the Northwest Oregon Labor Council, okay. and uh, we made a I, I made a motion it passed and was approved by the night body last Monday night on the 24th. That, is this a new one? Yes. What it is is that uh, any city, county, school district that wants the Northwest Oregon Labor Council's endorsement is going to have to sign a project labor agreement with the building trades. And that council and trades, well, that was a group of trades. Columbia crafts. Pacific building trades and or the made state up building of how many? trades. Made up. Well, I don't, uh, there's a, a number, number of affiliates. Right. All the building trades are right. affiliated okay. either with the Columbia Pacific building trades and probably with the state building trades. Project labor agreement ensures that the uh, job will be built uh, up to standards under Little Davis Bacon. And with that is the, uh, um, the Commissioner of Labor and Industries sets the wages for each craft as to what those are. It's called prevailing wage. Okay. Within that prevailing wage, let's say uh, the package is $50 mm -hmm. an hour. When you put the wages and the fringes, which is health and welfare and pension, then it doesn't necessarily ensure that the job is going to be union. It ensures that all bidders must pay These that prevailing, prevailing wage. wage. Okay. Now, the problem is is that the community standards that the Davis-Bacon Act was set out to do was to ensure that workers, uh, building trades workers, would have uh, their wage, 
they would have health and welfare, and they would have a pension. Now, if, if a non-union contractor, for example, would bid, uh, say the Selwood Bridge, and would get that bid, then they would take the same $50 and they could put $45 on the check and $5 on fringes or all $50. And a lot of workers, they think with their pocketbook first and think that's a good deal mm -hmm. because they're going to be getting uh, $50 an hour, say, versus 35 on the check. But what I think that's short-sightedness because mm -hmm. they need the health and welfare and they need the pension. Mm -hmm. And that's what the labor movement does. It provides family wage jobs, good health and welfare, and a pension so when the worker retires, he or she will have a... a so so in that project labor agreement, whether you're union or non-union, do you still have to consider the, the pension piece and the... And, well, and, it's and a package. That, let's say... That like, whole package. That, that's a Both whole ends? package. It's the wages and uh, the health and welfare right. and the pension. And right. Let's say that's a $50 that's package. package. Okay. The non-union company, what they will do is probably not, they don't, most they of won't them don't do, have they won't require it. The, they don't have, most of them don't have a pension. Right, right, right. Or it's a 401 But in this agreement, you, 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 they're what forced would, to do this? This would, with a project labor agreement, okay. what we're saying in the Northwest Oregon Labor Council to support our brothers and sisters in the building trades is that if you don't build, for example, the Selwood Bridge, right. then we're not going to support the measure if it has to be voted on the people. Uh, Columbia River Crossings, another one. Same concept. Same concept, but uh, that project's down the road. Right. They've spent 160 million developing it. It's time to build the bridge. Mm -hmm. Not only do we need it, mm -hmm. I mean, try any day of the week to. If you have to go to Vancouver for a five o'clock meeting, you got to leave at 2:30 in the afternoon mm -hmm. to ensure that you get there on time. Mm -hmm. Well, we and that's with two bridges. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, 205, what's been around for 25, 30 years, it was obsolete almost when it was opened up. Mm -hmm. And it was a great project. Mm -hmm. So we need, uh, we need the Columbia River Crossing Bridge. And <clears throat> they've studied it enough. And I think that uh, candidates running for city council or county commission, they've already voted to support it. If they don't support the Columbia River Crossing, then uh, Organized labor is probably not. I know that there that. were several other options. I've had them on the show uh, that, that they felt they weren't being get, given any consideration. But the point of the matter is, there will be a crossing of some sort. I mean, uh, the alternative was to go around like other major cities, that let the heavy trucks and whatever go around, maintain what's there, and then do something, do something different. But we're not going to get into that. Well, that I, I just don't. I, I don't the, think th that's possible. There will possible. be some work, though. There will be some work. Though. They've been work. studying this thing for 15 years, and 160 million is enough. Yes, yes, the yes. governors of Washington and Oregon got together. Uh, I believe uh, early this year, and they said mm -hmm. enough is enough. Right. Build the bridge, right. and right. I support that. Right. And right. organized labor support that. Right. It will bring jobs to to this community, and every construction job, to every construction dollar, turns an average of fifteen dollars back into the mm -hmm. economy. Mm -hmm. So local jobs. Okay, now that's the other thing too. Now, not only the contractor, the contractor bids the job if he brings his own labor force. What about that situation? Well, uh, under uh, uh, under, a under a public job, under a public works job in the state of Oregon, uh, th that job, it doesn't ensure that they're union, it's just that they have to pay the prevailing wages hour package. Yeah, but how do we deal, how do we react to the to the unemployment rate that we have in both the state of Oregon and Washington? We got almost, what, nine and a half, ten percent here. I mean, That's what, right. So what, what, in my opinion, what needs to happen is that, that these, the Multnomah County Commission, the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, whomever, mm -hmm has to make the position that you're going to sign a project, project labor agreement, right. which will be in the bid specifications. Okay. Then when the bid specifications are let, it's not a disadvantage to either the, the contract, any of the contracts, because they're playing by the same set of rules. Mm -hmm. And plus, you got that local option then. Mm -hmm. And then our local tradespeople and our local citizens can go to work, and then all the sundry jobs that that creates, it, it will uh, jumpstart the So economy. there's a possibility one could include that labor force, let's say 50% in Oregon, 50% in Washington, and whatever deal Oregon works with reference to making sure that people from Oregon are working on that job site. If right? it's not too late already, and I don't know that, but they need to try and work that out. We need to keep local craftspeople yeah, that working. Need, that needs to happen. Right. Yes, it does. I understand but, David Evans is the, is the lead person right right now? I am not. Was he? I'm not a building trader, so I'm not okay, sure about okay. that. Well, David Evans, I think he, he basically the lead person was handing out the checks to these consultants 
David Evans and Associates, kind of like a consulting well, they, engineer. It's been consulted to death. It's to death, time every... to move it okay. forward. But then the, build the bridge. But like you, you feel very strong about the fact we want to make sure we employ people here in Oregon, right, and, and in Washington, and Washington right, right, on both sides of the deal. Right. I mean, a lot of times you know people don't really protection this, but a lot of times, you know, but they can work a deal out. Yes, they can that, if they a, want to. Whether, as my mother would say, where there's a will, there's a way. Yes, yes, and tell mom say hi. She's she looking at the show. No, mom said up and probably reading. Okay, okay. Now you know the other the thing too is that again for the benefit of the viewing audience you know we, we talked a little bit about the davis bacon the little davis bacon uh did we kind of educate the people about what that is and what, what are the benefits okay. of the little davis bacon well davis bacon is a okay. federal law that okay. says on federal projects all of that project must be built with prevailing wages mm -hmm. and again the 50 dollars package the wages health and welfare and the pension little davis bacons are state projects that are still public properties are public projects and they have to build under this it's to ensure that that the proper wages hours and benefits mm -hmm. are to be paid but non-union contractors mm -hmm. get around it as i explained earlier in the show right, right 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 okay well now part and parcel of that is that uh, could one define maybe uh, the middle class you know, we hear this business about the middle class how many middle class folks are going to be a part and parcel of a project like this well let's talk a little bit about that <clears throat> The middle class, without... And what is the definition of a middle class from your perspective? From my perspective is, without the organized labor movement okay. in this state and in this country, we wouldn't have a middle class. Oh, how'd we get there? Well, because they insisted on family wage jobs, okay. health and welfare insurance. I mean, in 1957, uh, one of my machinist friends uh, t negotiated the first health and welfare medical dental and vision for seven dollars and fifty cents a month mm. that same package now is up around seven hundred dollars a month mm. and that's what inflation has happened we in this country spend almost 29 percent of our gross national product on health and welfare and we don't even and we have uh, 46 to 49 million americans still without health care i think that's criminal uh, they want to give president obama uh, a lot of problems and I don't know how any worker whether they're unionized or not could argue against this but the Republicans have put the spin on it and uh, basically st stolen the, uh, the political thunder and took over the House of Representatives mm -hmm. and we got a big election coming up in 2012 not for only for the presidency but for uh, Congress and the United States Senate mm -hmm. and this is going to go down as the no uh, for it, as the do nothing, the uh, Congress. They're absolute doing anything. The Republicans have the votes in the House and they've passed legislation. All they want to do is cut. Uh, the banks, uh, since they were bailed out, they're setting on three or four trillion dollars of assets that they could lend to small business and do some other things to get this country growing, uh, moving again and jump starting the economy. They won't do any of this. And the Senate, you have what's known as closure, takes 60 votes in the United States Senate to end debate. Right. And so much legislation over the years, they've had 50, per, 50 votes plus one vote. They've had 51 or more votes, but not 60. Not 60. And the whole process stops. Now in our state, we have two very good senators, Senator Ron Wyden and Senator Jeff Merkley. But the problem is Merkley supports doing away with closure mm -hmm. and Senator Wyden doesn't and the argument is that if you're in the minority party whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats you can stop uh, if you can get at least 40 votes or 41 votes mm -hmm. that you can stop a bill from being able right. to get voted on right. and you can stop maybe some very bad legislation but in the House of Representatives if you have 223 votes and 222 legislation moves forward. That's the political process. Mm -hmm. It happens in the Oregon State Senate. If you have 16 votes, a piece of legislation is passed. Mm -hmm. If you have 31 votes in the House, it's passed, and then it goes to the governor. Mm -hmm. And then to override the veto, the checks and balances, you need 20 senators in Oregon State and 40 representatives in the House of Representatives in Oregon. That's a good checks and balance system, in my, mm -hmm. my opinion, mm -hmm. and legislation gets passed mm -hmm. or not. Right. But to stop it on a parliamentary procedure of 60 votes is archaic and I don't think you get either party that would do away with it. Senate rules and Senate, Senate uh, tradition and I think it's a detrimental to this country and then what if uh, people want legislation passed 
good legislation, keep it on the book, keep, get good legislation passed, take bad legislation off the books, then they got to get 51 votes to do it. And mm -hmm. that's the democratic process. And to me, it would make some more sense. But the American public is what you allude to, is fed up. Mm -hmm. They're fed up and sick and tired of Congress not doing it. And the president, whether the Republican or Democrat, can't do anything. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to blame the president. Right, right, right. You, right, you right, can't, right. The president can't do it without Congress' help. A lot of people don't understand that, though. No, they don't. They don't. It's, he's just one person. That's right. And no man's an island. No, Fair. no man or woman is yeah. an island. And many people are in on the Hill, they're both Republicans and Democrats. If and they're and employee, there's been right? times there. when the Republicans have had control, and uh, they didn't do anything either. And that's what people are sick yeah, and right, tired of. Right. It's time for some collaboration. And in my opinion, one of the biggest reasons that President Obama is down in the polls is he has waited and waited and waited for the Republicans. His health bill, he went eight or nine months to get Richardson out of Texas or whatever, I forget the senator's name from Maine, one Republican vote. And what did he do? He lost all the thunder and got the uh, historic legislation mm -hmm, passed. Mm -hmm. And now they're trying to overturn it. The Republicans are bound and determined whatever they do. And it'll be interesting because well, they, it'll they, get to the Supreme they, Court. They recently agreed with the whole issue, kind of like a NAFTA deal and trade, uh, uh, trade bills. I mean, they passed that. You know, Three or four. Uh, what, what do you think about that? I mean, why did they get together on that particular issue? <clears throat> well, they there's two sides. Uh, I, I support Senator Ron Wyden. But he, I am what is called a what Jeff fa what fair tree. Jeff was okay on those. But the problem is, you're either a free trader or a fair tra trader. What does that now, mean? Now, free trader means that South Korea, NAFTA, and the, the, you know, the, the other agreements that we have signed, there's no guarantee. The workers don't get taken care of. I, I, I will be going down to Mexico for the 27th year in a row. Mm -hmm. And when I first went down there, construction labor was the best paid worker in Mazatlan, Mexico. They made $6 a day. $6 a day. $6 a day from sun up to sundown. And now after NAFTA, they get $7. And that's been about the last 10 years. So seven, and they work six days a week. All these Mexican people, they're a very strong Catholic nation. So they, Sunday's worship day, but people in the hotel industry and service industry still have to work. But people work six days a week. A uh, waiter gets $2.70 for an eight-hour shift. Mm -hmm. So what has NAFTA done for the Mexican people? Mm -hmm. Nothing. And when we outsourced all those jobs, yeah, a freightliner, that 1,500 or whatever, how many jobs that many, the many jobs. went down south of the border, now they've taken all the small control and the regulations of it. Now, uh, Bush, Bush, before he left, he's letting them cross back across. The, the into the United States. Now, where's the fairness there? Well, Sam, tell me this now. When when they were talking about this, you know, I and we just we just having a general a conversation about this deal. And when the when the owner, if you will, was saying, "Gee, was I, I, I'm losing. I'm not making a profit, if you will." And that's the whole rationale for I've got to ship this stuff out because I can get a I, I can get a better deal. Okay. Well, were, were we all at the table? Was it with the with the were the laborers well, or, at the table? Organized labor was not arguing for this. They were arguing against it. We had, you had family wage right, jobs, right. good health and welfare and good pensions, union jobs, and they outsource them out. These people are laid off and, hey, they have to find a job, much less paying if they can even find work. And it's time for the country to build its own. Mm -hmm. Look at the money that we're spending. And I am... I am kind of a, a hawk when it comes to war. But look at the money that we've spent in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Pakistan, all of that. And uh, the president has just announced by the end of the year that the troops are coming home from Iraq. Mm -hmm. But look at that. Hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, if we'd have taken but people that, were making money. I know contractors, contractors here were, were making money. I but mean, workers weren't uh, making you money. You know, in all due respect, military folks with, with family made right. They were making money. We're now we're now at thirteen and a half trillion dollars national debt. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. if we would start to rebuild our infrastructure in nineteen hundred, the city of Portland built dam number one. Mm -hmm. In nineteen fifty, they built dam number two. If they would spend one billion dollars and build dam number three and a filtration plant you up there in the bull run watershed you could supply water all the way from sandy oregon all the way through out to banks and gaston all the way out to wilsonville and it's the 
probably the best water in the country. Why aren't we doing it? Because we can't get the billion dollars. Where's the congressional what, delegation? Well, I don't know. Are they, they thinking they, along that line? I don't know, but you see, again, you got to get it through out of committee. The Republicans are never going to do anything, so that's going to put people to work. Look at the. But somebody got to Look at it, the though. thousands of jobs that right. would take okay. to put those there, and okay. look what we would do it for our system. Oh yeah, that's And huge. that the Tri County area, what do you got? Two and a half, three million people, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and every entity could get service from that. How many states does that involve? No, it just, just the, or it, this is just on this side, this of, the river, this side of the river, and, and it's the Tri-County area. You would start at Sandy, up there in the Bull Run watershed, right, okay. bring it on down, and you put that third dam in there, mm -hmm. and then you've got an inexhaustive supply of water. Now, it's the turbidity, that's basically dirt. Mm -hmm. You put it through the filtration plant, and then with the other treatment processes that mm -hmm. we have, there's mm -hmm. four big mains coming into Portland. Mm -hmm. You might have but another one or two, and then you could and build the mains, and that's a lot of construction jobs as well, and have the purest water in the country. No impact. What about the fish? Now we got that. We got this. Well, fish. the dam the is impact. already there. There's already two there. dams there already, okay. and so that would not have any any impact. Now the environmentalists would argue that building another dam would have some environmental impact, which is true up there, but it would be minimal. Yeah in comparison to the jobs that would be created and the purity of the water and just the simple water supply mm -hmm. that every community would have to pay. And I think that people's water bills would uh, have would be lowered at, after it was mm -hmm. paid for and got set up. You'd have to pay for the water mains and the things like that, you know, changing services over and those kinds of things. But a lot of work for a very good Well, that project. sounds doable. Now, well, who signs the, who signs the well, check? Well, it's got to be Congress. I mean, you'd Congress? have to get, but you'd also have yeah, to who, get... What's the flow? you got an intergovernmental problem that each of those entities might have to sign off. But I think if the city of Portland could get, uh, with their existing customers, if they could get uh, Congress to get the money, then it could be opened up for everybody in the area. And that what it would require some cooperation. Hmm. And... If you got something that makes sense, isn't that one billion dollars a lot more? No, it's not. Uh, we spend more than uh, what two billion, three billion a month or more over in each of those countries. Just one of those. Look at all the roads we could build, mm -hmm. and all the American workers we'd put it back to work. There's your middle class, and I am convinced that if the Republicans get their way, the we're going to have two two classes: very very wealthy people, and very very poor people. Now, about eight or nine months ago, on 60 Minutes, and he was President Reagan's, it starts with a B, forgive me, I don't even call his name, but he was, he was the author of the trickle-down theory that <laughs> never really worked, but he said that if you would take the wealthiest Americans, those that make a million or more, mm -hmm. and tax them 5% over two years, they would pay additional 5% that it would raise uh, six and a half trillion dollars. Hmm. Just the extreme wealthy have to pay a little extra. See, no, it was 10%, 10%. 10%. 10% more than what they're paying now. For two years, you bounce the national debt, uh, the, bounce the national, uh, you wipe out the national debt, and then you, we need to go to a balanced budget amendment when you've got those things done, and then live within your means like we have to do at the North Clackamas School District, which mm -hmm. I'm in my yeah, right. 17th year, and all the cities and counties and all the public entities in Oregon. You have to balance your budget, state of Oregon. Well, why, why, why are we fighting this attitude? Why, why, why are we fighting, you think? What's your, what's your feel? Well, you know, it's, a, it's a, it's a. I didn't want the lotto. You know, a, say, I, didn't, I won the lotto. I didn't, I've, never, I've never won the lotto, but my point is that you put a buck in and you win the lotto, a person become conservative. How overnight. many of them win? Well, you know, they could, they could come there's two hundred and forty. There's two hundred and forty-nine. I think uh, have won the millionaires in Oregon. Okay. Right. How, how long have we had it? Thirty-five years. How, how, how many have held it? You know, what I mean, but I, I don't know about that. But the point right, is, but I mean, it's a class struggle. It's a class struggle. If, if it's it's the rich want to get richer. Republicans, they don't want to make any cuts. They don't want to. Uh, uh, they want to wipe out the Obama cuts, and and they don't want to uh, uh, have and they just want people to pay fair taxes. Okay. Hey, this is sounding good. Uh, look what, what we're going to do now. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with Sam. Look like we're going to be getting quite a bit of information. Uh, maybe sort of give you a better feel of what's going on around you right now. We're right in the midst of a presidential election and, and elections here locally and, the, and all. And so anyway, we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit more time with Sam on that. Okay. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back.
You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, I guess we're back here. And again, I'm, uh, my, my guest today is uh, Sam Gillespie of UFCW, uh, i.e. we're talking about, uh, since, uh, since the major issue today is that uh, with the high unemployment week we have here in Oregon, and even from a national perspective, and it's, it's all about how do we get people to work. And in all due respect, uh, many of those folks, uh, uh, the, the focus area or focus group that tends to identify with the definition of labor force, in all due respect, is a union. You know, sure, there's open shop, but in most cases, a lot of time, open shop uh, entities are pretty well identified as the as the contractor aspect of it or the management end of the of the business. But in all due, I've said this for years, but the unions are basically, they are basically dealing with the employees. I mean, the workers, you know, the folks who are actually, you know, the, the various crafts and it's this, that, and the other. And so their interest is making sure that uh, these folks are protected, making making sure they're getting their medical, their pension, and a good and a, and a fair wage, if you will, and, uh, and and being very specific about making sure they do a good job too on the job. And so that's a very important piece. And, and a lot of times, from a contractor standpoint, that's the management end of it. That's a that's a whole different ball game. But both are working together in, in in many cases. So anyway, Sam and I, we've been just talking about a number of things. If you've just joined us, but uh, we're also getting into the politics, if you will, of where we are. You know, uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, Davis Bacon, Lil Davis Bacon. We've talked a little bit about the whole issue of NAFTA, and I want to spend a little bit more time about that piece because we did go through a time which you all of a sudden we just sort of we sort of shipping shipping our jobs out of this country, and in all due respect, in some cases, uh, both sides were involved at the table, and so now how do we get these jobs back? And let's let's start off right right off with that, Sam. How do we get these jobs when back? When I first here? became a full time union representative in 1975. We had, uh, we were doing six, seven billion dollars trade deficit a month. Now we're doing like 160, 170, 180 billion a month. Wow. And that's how the imbalance of trade has done, has happened. That's where your, the erosion of the middle class comes in. That's that tax base. I think, to be fair, if you're an American company, and you want to go produce uh, goods and services overseas, mm -hmm. then you ought to pay income tax on the full bore here. Mm -hmm. And that would go a long ways to level it out, the playing field. But um, outsourcing of jobs does nothing for this country. Mm -hmm. It does something for the companies and the rich. They get richer and richer, and then the poor get poor, and you erode the middle class, the working people of this country. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, when, when we talk about outsourcing, in all due respect, uh, whether it's outsourcing or insourcing, uh, there's always an entity that's collecting the money here. Now, when they outsource the business, let's put it that way, the owner of the company gets the revenue. And what percentage of that's what I'm people talking about. in this country yeah, 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 yeah. get that? Are, are there are working. very few owners and a heck of a lot of workers. Right. You see what I'm saying? Sure. And then when they're insourcing business, let's say we, we hear the business about China. 
if you will, holding that, holding that big money ball over our head, if you will. But the bottom line is that when, when China's selling cars and this, that, and the other, they create businesses for maybe one person or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's not a situation where you have Chinese. Where the profits go when, they, when a foreign-made car, I don't drive one. Okay. The, when the car, these, and some of them are okay. The United Auto Workers have them organized, and they get livable wages, working conditions, health and welfare, and pensions. But where do the profits go? Overseas. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole thing. And uh, I'm not saying that. How can we say no to that? Well, I, well, we don't the, be a I alluded to it earlier. Yeah, okay. Uh, free trade is what we've got in all the all these yeah, trade agreements. Board, right. Everything goes out, and they bring whatever they come in without any tariffs. Fair trade would be the same thing that we would put a tariff on their goods coming in. Right. And that's what you call fair trade. Why hasn't that and been that done? Would be, because politically, 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 both sides, both of them, big right? money involved. Right, 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 right. Big money, and you talk about a world economy. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be ethnocentric and build yeah. a, a little a yeah, build a fence yeah. around this country. Yeah, right. But we have to start doing a little bit more to take care of our own in this country, mm -hmm. and our own people, and our own infrastructure. And talking about getting rid of the postal service, I mean it's in the Constitution. And what people don't know is that they said that they had um, the government forced on the postal service that they had 75 years of health and welfare and pension contributions that they had to make up in 10 years. So basically, it's called their unfunded liability. That is just craziness. But yet, that's what uh, the government did and Congress did to the Postal Service. The Postal Service is actually making money if they didn't have to pay this all back at that rate. Mm. And look at it, they complain about supporting uh, Amtrak and the freight system in this country. When you start not taking care of your roads, not keeping your railway system up, losing your Postal Service or cutting it back, that's what this country's all about. And so it's time to start taking care of ourselves and these entities with American workers and American uh, family wage jobs. You know, going back to that post, that was kind of an interesting area because you think with the technology that we're having right now, you know, with these smartphones and this, that, and the other, and especially with the with the young folks coming up, and where a lot of times they're not using the services. Well, I heard the post uh, postmaster general uh, on a talk show about two weeks ago on the way to work, okay. and he was talking about his efficiencies, and he said that tech. Technology yeah, had hurt them crazy. some, yeah. but there's a still a huge demand. And to cut out Saturday mail service and to close 14, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 rural post offices mm -hmm. uh, and eliminate Saturday mail, I don't think that we need to be doing that in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is an investment in ourselves, and let alone the jobs. The postal workers do it and the clerks and everybody that makes the Postal Service work do a, a fine job. Okay, all right. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do, folks, at this point in time. If you'd like, you'd like to join in the conversation, you can give us a call. I'm going to put the phone on the phone number on the on the screen, and you can give us a call. And for those of you who are interested in sending us out to some other folks, you can email us, email the show, if you will, because we're on YouTube now. You can you can email it out. Uh, uh, this is a live show now, but you can email the show, and and then they can you can share this this conversation with others uh, uh, outside of the area, if you will, for that matter. But uh, again, uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the other concern. Is that okay? We got these concerns, but people are very upset with government. I mean, i.e., elected officials now. I mean, people are really upset. They're not taking the lead. Well. The point is, I think the president has tried to show leadership, but he's not yeah, getting no any man's an what, what, Well, that's it. It's the see, Congress. It's the well, Congress. It's the Congress. And and what the are you going to do? The Republicans are setting on it and doing nothing. He went with them. He met with them. He said, give me a plan. Show me an alternative. And they have none. Uh, put a jobs plan together. You see any of the Republicans? You see the Republicans in the House coming forward with a jobs bill? President's put a job bill on the table, and they won't, they won't even endorse it. They won't have hearings or anything else. That's what you get in Washington when you are the uh, in charge in power party. And the American public's fed up with the Republicans or Democrats. But uh, we pass a lot of legislation uh, when we, in the first uh, two years that uh, 
President Obama was in office when the Democrats had control of both. Mm -hmm. And they had an agenda and they got a bunch of things done. One of them was health care. Was it a perfect piece of legislation? No. It could have been a lot better if the Republicans would have participated in the process and worked it out and compromise were to be had. But this big committee they've got, what is it, a committee of 10 or 20? Yeah, equally, uh, and, equally and, R's and D's, right? R and House of Representatives right. and, and, the, and Senate. the Senate. right? And they're, uh, Senator Patty Murray from Washington State right. is she's, one of the co-chairs. Right. One of the co-chairs. And uh, all we get from them is that they've done nothing. They, they don't want to... Uh, they want to take away the taxes on the rich that were instituted in the first two years, which were a revenue enhancer. Mm -hmm. You're spending, we're spending more than what we're taking in. That's understood. But you have to put some revenue on the books, cut spending, and, and do it logically. And they won't say whether they're going to touch Social Security. Whichever party messes with Social Security will be unelectable. Well, you know, as, you, as you're making that point, and then all this, all this talk back and forth routine is supposed to be a government of the people by the people and for the people that's right and we elect folks to basically represent that entity so representative you know what I'm saying? so maybe maybe I, i'm just throwing it out maybe we, we, we should have voted on the issue rather than quote uh, maybe uh, let now representative basically talk to this president back and forth politically because everybody's trying to vie for their for their own situation you got me just a few minority but the majority of the people are saying we don't like that form of situation why can't they just go on with a national vote on some of the issues, some of the main issues, like health care and things of that nature? Why well, can't we do that? Well, you could, but again, you'd have to get 223 uh, House of Representatives to agree to do it. Then the Senate would have to get 60 votes to ju 60 votes just to close debate, mm -hmm. and it never gets done. Yeah, That's why represent. it's a constant they're vicious circle. And they're representing the people. That's right. And then we're right in the midst of politics, i.e., uh, you know, one side's a Republican, one side's a Democrat, and they say, look here, uh, Republicans are in, so guess what, I'm not going to do anything that they're wanting to do, yeah. because I want, the, I want to see, and vice versa. The Republicans' whole, whole agenda is cut taxes, no revenue, and not take care of people. And, and they call, uh, and, and they are, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are entitlements. They're entitlements that my mother, without Social Security and Medicare and well, Medicaid, either. could not survive. And she's one of millions, yeah, millions. hundreds of millions right. of right. retired people right. that Social Security is their sole source of income. She and my father worked all their lives mm -hmm. so that they, they could have this. FDR had this vision. Everybody called it the great thing. Now they want to start tampering with it. Well, I've been paying Social Security since I was 14. My dad got me work permits so I could flag for him on jobs. And I want my part of the pie in a few years when I retire. I want my Social Security. I need the Social Security. I paid in it all my life. I would be even willing to raise it a point or two. Mm -hmm. If you raise Social Security, they've got a temporary cut on now. You go back to where we were and raise a point on both the employers, 1%, and 1% on the employees, mm -hmm. and you take the cap off, you'll balance Social Security. And then they got to put Social Security in the bank and leave it alone. Well, they've been spending that for no, years. And that's the problem. <laughs> and it has to be fixed, and they need to fix it. It's a, it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I guess the other thing, too, about this whole issue with the health care bill that, the, that President Obama put on the table, there was some from, from here at the Pacific Northwest that didn't, didn't, didn't support it. I think DeFazio was one of them. And everybody well, had their own plan, so to speak, as opposed to just, you know, one thing I can say about those Republicans, they do stick together. Well... Does that help the process? When no, it doesn't, get, but I'm just saying. They're the party of obstruction. Right, right. Um, and that's what they are. And okay. people are elected. Mark Hatfield was a, a Republican oh, he's, he's a a senator yeah. who had respect on both sides oh, of the aisle, yeah. but he knew how to compromise. He, he, he used the political process to get elected, mm -hmm. and then he went back to Washington. He was, was respected by both sides of the aisle to find compromises and pass legislation that would help people, the people that elected him. And we've gone way, way out of bounds of all of that. And until that gets fixed, there's some people who say throw out everybody. I don't support that. But there's a lot of people that just think everybody should be tossed out and start over with a whole new slate. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you got, we've got President Obama now. And you, you notice it was, once he was elected, uh, immediately uh, the chairman, of the, the Senate chair, um, uh, McConnell, Senator McConnell made it very clear that uh, he's going to do everything he could just to make sure that he didn't get reelected. 
That's right. What was that all about? That was the minority what, leader because. What was that about? Well, it's because he was he's the Republican minority leader, and he didn't want he didn't want the uh, kind of progressive uh, politics that the president represents and espoused and has tried to get done. Uh, the jobs bill, they call it dead on arrival before he ever gets the jobs bill out, and they don't even hold hearings. They don't want to talk about it. Okay, what's their solution? Mm -hmm. What's their solution? Mm -hmm. See, if you're gonna, if you just want to sit back and kill something, that's the easiest thing to do. It's a heck of a lot easier to kill a bill than it is to get one passed, at the state level and the federal level. So, if you want to be a leader, regardless of party, then lead, and then talk to your colleagues and say, let's do something for the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Let's take this caller. Caller on the air. Your question or comment, please. Yes, caller. How, do, how does your guest propose? that we pay or the government pay for Obamacare? How do you, in dollars and cents, taxes, are you gonna to go to China and get the money? How do you propose to pay for Obamacare? Okay. And I'll take my message off there. Thank That's you, Carla. Okay, in Canada, in Finland, Sweden, Japan, and even Mexico, they have forms of national health care. Now, is the Canadian system perfect? No, but they have, uh, everybody has access to health care, and it's 10% of their gross national product. We have 29% of our gross national product in the United States, and we have 46 million Americans without access to any health care. I think the wealthiest nation in the, in, the, in the world ought to be able to do something for its people. Now, I think there's going to have to be some cost-saving uh, cost measures, second opinions, prescription drugs. There's a senator in either Rhode Island or Maine, once a month, takes two busloads of his constituencies into Canada to get drugs. My, my ex-mother-in-law had heart medication. It was made by Squibb. We would go down to Maslan, Mexico, and... She had two medications. It would be right there in English when it was, the medication was uh, date stamped for when it would lose its potency. And we would buy her a year's supply of both heart medications. And she would save $650 a year. And that was 20 years ago. Hmm. So prescription drugs is a big one. You uh, could pool your resources, do uh, national pooling. You could have uh, w regional companies that produce the drugs and whatever. Now the drug companies aren't going to make as much money, so they're going to oppose that. And they're going to lobby and, and all these congressmen and senators. There's cost savings and whatever. But I guess it gets down to your value system. And, and I don't have any problem of saying, we got to find ways to pay for it. I agree with that. Is it a perfect bill? No. But just to go out and say no is not the answer. And if you're okay with having 46 to 49 million Americans not having any health care and when you go to the emergency room, it costs 10 times what it does to go see your physician at his or her clinic. And emergency care is very expensive, 10 times. So we have to do some things. And if you do some preventive measures, uh, John Kitzhaber, when he was, before he was even announced he was going to run for governor, made a presentation for the Central Labor Council. It was a wonderful presentation on factual data. And what he said, and I never, if you look at it like this, the human body is like a car. Mm -hmm. When we're young, we don't need a lot of maintenance. We've got to change the oil mm -hmm. and yeah. rotate the yeah. tires right. yeah. and those things. Yeah. But when that car gets old, yeah. it, it start, the parts yeah. begin to wear down. The engine goes and, yeah. and you know, you the, the air conditioning and, and everything off. else. <laughs> so what you do is you do preventive things. Yeah. You do maintenance along. And that's one of the things, heart disease, cancer, some of these other things that people need to do and get smart and, and do things better. I can lose, uh, I've lost 15 pounds. I need to lose another 60. I want to live to a ripe old age. My mother's mm -hmm. going to be 91. I want to join her at 91 uh, someday. She'll be gone by that time. But I want to live a long life. I've worked hard. And so we have to do things to live a healthy lifestyle. So it's a matter of philosophy sometimes. Tell me this. What do you feel about increasing the age of uh, retirement? Well, <laughs> I don't think that... Uh, when that, I say retirement, I'm jumping for, for, for To me, you work your whole Social life Security. to retire. So, yeah, okay. Okay. And anyone that does not get 20 years of 
healthy, happy, productive retirement where you can just relax and enjoy life, your grandkids, your great grandkids, travel, do something, then you've been gypped. You've been denied something that you should get. How many times do you hear somebody, they retire and within two years they go, they die? That's criminal, but it happens. And so um, raising, they may have to raise the level of retirement on younger workers to make the system work. But in my opinion, you, you've got to do something to, to fund Social Security. What we in labor call for a pension plan is the, the same thing, unfunded liability. Well, we made a commitment, everyone pays Social Security, even people that are self-employed, then I think they're entitled to get something. Take the cap off so everybody can get it, raise the percentage one on one leave it alone, work on getting the banks to invest money in this country and to workers and projects, infrastructure. We talked about the one billion for the, uh, the third dam and the filtration plant in the city of Portland water system, what that could do for the whole region. And then in addition, how many jobs that would, that would produce and put people to work. And it takes time, but those are choices that I think we can make and better spend our tax dollars. Okay, good. Uh, Caller, you on the air. Your question or comment, please. Yes, caller. Hi. Hi there. I have, I have a comment I'd like to make, and I'm wondering what you guys think of it. Sure. Um, I think that everybody blames the president uh, about the economy, but um, I have some other ideas, such as um, overseas uh, buying started about the time that quality air equipment was uh coming through, being voted through, mm -hmm. and um, also computers have taken a lot uh, of jobs away, and um, then uh, I don't know if it's ever a good economy during the wars uh, that we've had through the years, and I'd also like to say that um, I would be all for the Obama medical plan but I saw that it wasn't quality care in Oregon when we tried it, especially dental. They wouldn't see me unless I needed a tooth pulled, mm. and unless my pain was tin, you know. Okay. And um, so I just wonder what you guys. It's, I think it's a big combination. Oh, there's more people too as far as finding jobs. Right. 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 Thank you very much, Carla. Let's it, let's go backwards there. on it. The Oregon Health Plan was a good concept. And what it was to take care of was people that had no health insurance whatsoever. And so all they could afford to do was take care of, like you said, if you had unfortunately have a, uh, uh, have a tooth uh, pulled. If you have a health care system that takes care of everybody and all of your health care needs, then you could do the preventive uh, stuff, that uh, preventive care that you need to do so that you, you won't have to go in and have the tooth extracted. They can repair it, the tooth, they can fill it, they can get the ca it's cavities, uh, early detection before it takes your, the whole tooth. Just like cancer, people survive cancer these days based on the fact that of early detection. If every, but what about the 46 million people that in this country that don't have any access to anything like that? And I just think, and I'm a, I'm a Democrat, I'm a liberal, but I, I'm a person who cares about people and think that everybody should have, uh, a, be able, we, they ought to have health care, they ought to be able to have medical, dental, uh, vision uh, care. Okay, we will say one thing, we're having a discussion. Right. It's a discussion now, and, right. and it, it will, something will bottom line on it, you know, from the standpoint of saying, this is the health plan that we'll have in these United States. One, one way or the other, it will have something, right? Fair? Well, we're either going to have one or we're not, and if the Republicans get their agenda, uh, again, they, did, they were given multiple opportunities to come up with a plan and didn't. That's where the confidence of the American voter, the average uh, citizen, doesn't have any confidence, and rightfully so, in mm -hmm. Congress, because they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got to set party differences aside and lead. It used to be that being elected to the 
uh, city council or to the state house or to the Congress or the United States Senate was an honor. And you served because you wanted to help the people. Now, they'll all espouse that that's what they want to do. But we've gotten way far away from that and needs to come back to that. That's my understanding. Well, now that we, you know, this is this is Governor Kitzhopper's second term, if you will. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's another first, term. first, first person to ever be elected in a third time third, in the third term in this really? several tried. Yep, wow, so he's wow, first wow. one ever, and he's a physician. That's right. See, that's right. That emergency put that room Yeah, he's an emergency room physician, and he was basically the one that put that first health plan together. Yes, he did, right. as president of the Senate right, right. and as governor. And I'm sure he's probably talking about this at this point in time. Sure. Okay, good. Look, we have about a couple more minutes or so. If anyone wants to give us a call and and uh, and pose a question to Sam, he's willing. You, you can see he's very open, and we're honored to have him here now because, in all due respect, we're talking about jobs, 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 and one way or the other, we've got to do something, folks. We really have to do something. It can't be just an I type thing, but at the same time. We elect people to be our leaders, to talk to these issues. Very, very important. And my point is that give them a call. Call them up. Ask them where, they, where is their position? What are they doing? I mean, right now, in all due respect, I, I just noticed uh, uh, President Obama's out there beating the beat. Where are they? I mean, where are they knocking on doors? On both sides of the aisle, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what are they doing here in Oregon about jobs? And what are they, just like the caller just called about the whole issue with the, uh, the health care bill, about everything for that matter. We've got to get out of the politics to a certain degree and let the majority of the people represent where we're going. And the only way you, you got that right now is through the elected officials. That's right. Okay. Well, they're a voice. So we're a representative democracy. That's right. True democracy is one person, one vote. That's right. And uh, we can't have that in That's this right. country. That's right. uh, we have representative democracy. So we elect people to represent us. That's right. And they got to go back and represent the majority. And the other problem is, you put 10 people in a room, you're going to get 10 ideas of how to fix it. If mm -hmm. you can't come to a consensus and compromise, you're not going to get anything done. Uh, it's just like we in the union. We don't get five positions. We don't get four. We don't get three. We get one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One position. Mm -hmm. And it's tough to get smart, strong-willed individuals together. And that's what you have in Congress mm -hmm. and you have in the state houses. But real leaders find ways to cross the aisle, so to speak, mm -hmm. and work with one another to get legislation that's going to benefit people mm -hmm. and to get the president or the governor to sign the legislation. You know, we got about two or three more minutes. What's going on at the legislature right now? Any, any feedback on, on the whole issue of jobs and this, that, and the other? Well, they've done what they can. I mean, uh, just the whole school issue. When we went out of... Uh, um, like I said, I've been on the school board for 17 years. I ran for the legislature in 94 and again in 2000 to get uh, permanent funding for skills, and we're not any closer. We, uh, our former su superintendent, Ron Nasal, thought it would take three years. We're already in our fourth year, and we've got, we think, at least three more. And we can't do any more cuts. We're one of the options we're looking at is a local levy. Be Beaverton's got one, not because they want it. Portland at least got their 49 or whatever million operating levy reinstituted. They didn't get their bond bill, uh, and it was only about two thirds. Uh, Oregon Public Schools should uh, they need to b refurbish those buildings, get the asbestos out of them, update them. Uh, the education takes, I don't know, uh, a big chunk of the state budget. Started with uh, ballot measure five, all to limit taxes so it would have enough money in state government. And the corporate, uh, when I first started lobbying the legislature, uh, <clears throat> citizens paid this amount of money, corporations paid this. Now it's reversed. Hmm. And if the Democrats who had control in those years, yeah, with means. Democratic governors, Democratic House and Senate, would have heard the call instead of all the spending and brought it more to a level playing field, it might have taken care of it. Wow. But they lost an opportunity. Wow. Well, on that particular note, an opportunity, we're going to get him back here so we can talk a little bit more about that education piece. Again, we've run out of time, Sam. Thanks very much for being with us. You bet. Appreciate it. And as George Page always said, folks, as I've always said, back to what you believe in. Have a good one. See you next week. We've got a good show next week. Take care.